Good evening, everybody. My name is Michael Bond. I am a senior technical analyst uh, based in Hawaii. So it is a beautiful, clear 86 degree day. Uh, I hope you are having uh, equally nice weather wherever you are located. Um, and welcome to tonight's uh, presentation on scenario design. To give you a little background about myself, um, I have an eclectic uh, analyst background. I started off life as a China hand, so I am fluent in Mandarin, have two degrees from The Ohio State University, one in Mandarin, one in East Asia Studies with the focus on the PLA and its modernization. Um, kicked around DC for a couple of years doing translation type work, uh, then went to George, or George Washington University where I got a master's in security policy with a focus on uh, defense analysis and data analytics, uh, and then have been working in the FFRDC space for about four and a half years now. Uh, reflecting my background, my analytical profile is pretty diverse. Um, I do kind of traditional China hand things, but I also do a fair bit of war game design. Um, and as some of you may know, I also was part of the team that helped Sebastian uh, put together the Toro Commander. So it's a, a game that we're very proud of. Uh, and if you haven't had a chance to play it yet, I encourage you to uh, take the chance. Um, but tonight, I'd like to focus on one aspect of, of game design, and that's scenario design. Um, this is a, a critical part of, of really getting a war game right. Um, I'll note that there are, you'll find that there are no hard, fast rules. You can read uh, Applegate, you can read McCaffrey, you can read Perla. Um, and there's this kind of sense that, that it's definitely the art, part of the art side of war gaming. Um, and you should do it right, but it's not necessarily clear how you do it right. So I'm hoping that we can, I can give you some guidelines. I can talk about things that that work, especially for the national security side of war gaming. Perhaps would be applicable to other types of gaming in general. Um, but because this is for go goose, sorry, I keep trying to call it goose. Um, I do want to approach tonight as more of a discussion uh, than a straight lecture. Uh, as such, we will, uh, Sebastian will grab questions. Um, I'll stop at, period at, at times to ask for questions. Um, I also invite uh, my colleagues who are on the call who uh, perhaps have um, who have worked in this space as well to provide their insights. Um, again, this is a student organization. We are here to help you uh, develop into the next generation of war gamers. Um, and so I wanna make sure that we have the time to answer your questions. Um, and give you advice to help you in your career path. Um, you'll notice that I have uh, I have subtitled this presentation "How I Ruined My Perfectly My Perfect War Game with Sloppy Scenario Design," um, and so that's where I think we'll spend most of our time tonight is talking about the the kind of the two big pitfalls I see that happen, uh, or at least that I fall into when designing a scenario for war game. But before we we dive into that. Let's uh, let's talk a little bit about what I mean when I talk about a scenario. Um, this is from Applegate and Co. The Craft of Wargaming. It's a great book. If you don't own it, recommend that you buy it, read it. Um, but I like what he what they say here. Right, a scenario sets the stage for the player decisions. It's the common starting point from which the sponsors, players, analysts, and other war game participants address the objectives of the game. So the way that I tend to think about a scenario. Right, that if a war game is a type of play, right, the scenario are the set pieces. They're the uh, king functions that help your, your players think about what is the question I'm being asked, what resources do I have to solve it, um, what decisions can I make to get to this desired end state. Um, that's really important because if we, there's a lot of ways we can we can look at a scenario, right? We looking at it, we can look at it from just the perspective of the story, right? Which is not bad, right? Scenario writing to a certain extent is story writing. Um, but if all you do to set out to design a scenario is to tell a good story, um, often the story does not uh, align with the objectives of the game. Uh, and so your, your story can actually end up pushing your players uh, away from what you're actually trying to achieve in your game. Um, and so I want to be very, very careful that we, as you are thinking through your scenario designs, um, that you remember that it is a tool in service of your players 
to help them understand the objectives and the decision space that they'll be playing in. Um, so this kind of gets me, this is not my, my favorite graphic that I've ever put together. Uh, as those who know me can uh, testify, I am not necessarily artistically inclined. Um, <laughs> so this is the best you'll get from me. But a scenario works with the rules and the player's aid, right? To, to give a space for the game to take place. Generally, um, the scenario combines with the player aids um, to give the, the players tools to interact with the rules and with each other. Uh, and what I mean by that is if you think about any you know, tabletop game, don't even have to be a war game, but any tabletop game that you have played in your life, generally there is, you know, you have the rules in the rule book, right, which tell you what you can do and how those actions will be adjudicated. And then you have a board and you have uh, player tokens and you know, maybe you have a clock or a spinner or dice. Um, things that help you track the decisions that you're making and the outcomes of those decisions. The scenario, right, is that is that setting. So if we talk about, uh, for a moment, I'll talk about um, a not a, a national defense or an analytical war game, but a fun war game, uh, Scythe, which is a, a game I thoroughly enjoy. Um, the scenario, right, is is laid out at the beginning of, of that rule book, right, that you are playing for this, you're playing as a, a national faction, um, and you are trying to achieve your objective of uh, putting your nation in a better uh, final state um, through military economic um victories uh and seizing territory over um your counterparts it's a very basic very kind of lightweight scenario but that scenario is reflected in the board design right the the way that the hexes are laid out and the land features are used right drive your player drive the players towards economic and uh, military conflict um the player cards which tell you what you can do um right are uh in terms of um those same actions right and those actions are all aligned with the concept of my objective is to you know have more economic goods own more territory and have more military victories right so there's this this beautiful alignment between the rules the player rates and the scenario that help the players um accept this decision space one of the terms that you'll hear uh, thrown around a lot, right, is don't fight the scenario. Um, and really what that means is don't pick apart the scenario. Uh, I have found, and we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit later, so this is a little bit of a lead in. Um, when there is a mismatch between your player aids, your scenario, or your rules, that provides seams, right, that that if we used creative writing terms, right, it, it you break the suspension of disbelief. Um, and your pair, players are going to start picking at those those seams because it, it it seems off. Um, now look, you're going to have players that for whatever reason have an active grind. Maybe they don't like wargaming as a methodology. Maybe they don't like the problem set to begin with. They don't like the the way it, you're approaching thinking about this problem set, right? And they're going to come in and everything is going to be questioned. Certainly is going to happen. There are techniques for dealing with that that we won't talk about today. Um, but I also want to be clear that we, we can do ourselves a disservice, right? When we have scenarios that are poorly laid out, poorly aligned with the objectives of the game, um, and don't match well with the rules of the player aid, right? We players players sense that very quickly and then start pushing back and not necessarily unrightly. Um, and so we want to try to prevent that as much as possible. Um, the uh, oh, I see Matt, there's Matt. Um, before we, we move on and start talking about um, some methodologies and some uh, um, issues that, that arise, I, I just want to stop. So any questions on um, what a scenario is, how it, it works um, with the other tools of uh, the other aspects of a war game? Hey, Mike, can you yeah. explain for the crowd what is the difference in scenarios in commercial game designs versus the professional games that you do at RAN? Yeah, absolutely. That's a that's a really good question. We'll we'll go into detail about that a little bit 
Um, but we get we certainly do it now. Um, so one of the big things, and we'll talk about this more in objectives, is that you the objectives for a for fun game, right, a commercial game, and for uh, an analytic or an exploratory game like what we do at the Rand Corporation um, is fidelity to reality, right? So the purpose of a fun game, fidelity to reality can be a part of it, but at the end of the day, you want that game to be fun. You want uh, a concept of balance that all the players have a chance to win. Perhaps the, the way they win is asynchronous, so the things that they're aiming for aren't the same, um, but you, you, want that, you want that ability to be there. Um, in the analytical game, our primary focus, right, is on presenting uh, a reasonable approximation. I say reasonable because you can't simulate the world, right? If you're going to simulate the world, then you're just doing field testing and it's cheaper to go do field testing. Um, so you, you we're looking for a reasonable approximation of the real world state for whatever time period and place that we're talking about. Um, that gets, of course, harder as you, you go further down the timeline, right? And there's there's larger and larger chances of there being a delta between your predicted space and, and reality. Um, but that means that you are willing to sacrifice uh, the fun for some of the players for reality. So the, you know, balance quickly ceases to be an issue, right? If it turns out that, you know, the U.S. has really good missile defense uh, and they're fighting Pinelandia, uh, right, um, which is a common stand-in for certain countries, um, or they're, let's say they're fighting Iraq, right? So we'll, we'll, you know, go back to the global war on terrorism. Um, in a commercial game, right, we would want to provide the, the Iraq players with a way to, to kind of overcome that. Um, so the game is fine. So they don't feel like they get to team roll. In the real world, right, Iraq never bought really capable cruise missiles. And so if they start, you know, they mostly worked on scuds and it turned out that, you know, pack twos were really good at shooting down scud missiles. Um, that might not be fun for the Iraqi players, but it is an accurate representation of the real world. Right? We're trying to understand how these complex systems interact. Um, and so the scenario for an analytical game should reflect those realities, right? It should also reflect, and we'll talk about this a little bit in the, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the research portion should reflect the the, the operational concepts, or strategic concepts of the countries that you are representing, unless you're specifically trying to do uh, a game where um, you're kind of exploring unknowns, right? You know, in essence, your your research concept is like, what if we just throw it all out the window, right? And that can be a, a useful game, but generally, right, you want to be as accurate as possible and still have the game be playable. Um, and we'll talk about this on on one of the uh, the sins that you can commit. Um, so that you are not biasing the, out, the, the outputs of your study. All right, any other questions before we move on? No questions now, Mike, you can press on. Sounds good. All right, let us press then. So there's a lot of different ways you can build a scenario. This is how I approach it. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so keep in mind, this is, this is just one methodology, but the way I like to think about a scenario or really about a war game, right? Is you have to have sides, you need to have factions. Uh, I, I think Perla and co are absolutely right that a war game, um, needs at least two sides because you need to have contested decision-making, right? You need to make a decision you need the other side to react to that decision and you need to deal with the outputs, the consequences, the outputs of, of, that, of that reaction. And therefore you need to have two sides, um, two or, or more sides. And those sides need to have things, you know, capabilities, they, they need to have things to do, right? They have to have resources to execute those decisions with. And that can go into forces. Now I, I say forces because I, I approach this from a national security DOD war gaming perspective, right? So I, in that context, when I, I say forces, I mean forces, you know, what, how many Marines, how many arm, you know, how many soldiers, how many sailors, airmen, um, guardians, do you, are you allocating to this fight? What equipment are they bringing, right? What is that organization? Um, 
that is a very, you know, I, I tend to do operational games. So that's, I, I do that kind of the operational level. So I think in terms of battalions and brigades and companies, you might do a Paul Mill game where you're looking across the spectrum of what the US military or the US government can bring. So if you haven't heard the term dime, you will. <coughs> Apologies, I, apparently something stuck in my throat. Um, right, diplomacy. Uh, but think of that as whole of government. And so forces might be, you know, there might be a military aspect, but there might be a diplomatic aspect. But what kind of diplomatic resources or actions can you take are available to you? Um, you also need a location for these events to occur. Now, that location can be broad or narrow. Um, that depends on the objectives of your game, which we'll talk about in a moment. And the last thing is you, you need the why. The road, often the why is called the road to war. Um, and this is the, the fictional, quote unquote fictional, um, art part, really the art part of, of scenario design. This is where you get to say, why are fight, folks fighting? What are the objectives of my two sides? What are they trying to accomplish? Um, what led up to the current situation and what is their current deployments uh, in comparison to each other? This is where I have a lot of fun. I, I really enjoy writing Roads to War because it's an opportunity to think about the what if. Um, I will note, the reason I say this is the, the art side um, is because most war games to one degree or another, when you're talking about national defense war games are projecting the future to a certain degree, right? Because when we're talking about analysis, we're talking about changing concepts, we're talking about um, changing, uh, looking at potentially new technologies to incorporate into the force, uh, force design changes, right? So we're talking about things that we wanna do in the future. Um, and therefore we're counting for future technologies and perhaps changes in uh, our adversaries, uh, force organizations. So we're talking about con conflicts that have not yet occurred. So you're project, there's, there's a really, I enjoy this thought experiment of trying to understand from both sides, what would drive conflict? What kind of actions would put these two sides into conflict? Uh, a great example of this is when uh, we were working on Littoral Commander. We were working on the first, scen first scenario that we designed, which is Rumble in the Jungle, uh, which is the, the Luzon uh, scenario. It's the first one we designed. We spent uh, probably a month going back and forth on just what was our road to war? What was going to put you know, a Marine Littoral Regiment on you know, in, in this kind of under current circumstances, kind of improbable situation, you know, where their boots on the ground on Luzon and the PLA, Navy, Marine Corps, uh, Plan MC, uh, we're also going to be there. And there's going to be this chance for conflict. And we, I mean, we went through probably six or seven different ideas, right? And there was, there was a, certainly an element of research, but it was also an element of trying to really understand the both sides, right? And what their needs were, the kind of situations where they would take on these kind of actions, right? Um, and that could be really rewarding, right? Just like I think any kind of creative writing project would be very rewarding when you get it right. <coughs> the, uh, where I liken this the most is to learning to write historical fiction, right? Where you're not, you're taking historical events and you're adding a twist, same kind of thing. The, uh, <coughs> excuse me, there is uh, there's a lot of fog on uh, Oahu right now. And it's, uh, uh, yeah, it, um, it tends to make me cough. Um, so the first thing that you do when we start talking about scenario design, so the, the things that you really should do before we get to, to the things that get you in trouble is you need to write an objective statement for your game. And I understand that, right, like, yeah, Mike, that is a basic game design principle. You start with an objective statement. But it is especially true for, for scenario design because it, it's that touchstone you always have to get back to. <coughs> it's not just about, as I said, right, if we were just going to write historical fiction, we could just write historical fiction. But we're doing this for a purpose. We're doing this for... <coughs> my case, an analytical 
game. And if the scenario doesn't serve the objective of that game, right, then my sponsor has wasted a lot of money. We don't get the answers that we're looking for. We don't get usable data. And we've wasted a bunch of people's time. So it's really critical that you write a very clear objective statement, right? You want to understand what is the purpose of my game? What, why are people playing it? What am I hoping to, to get out of it? What is my understanding? Um, you know, the stage, what is my desired end state in total? What do I want my players to know? What do I, what do I want to know? Um, how many times do I want to run this game to get that information? You want to do that all up front. Um, because you can design a scenario, a beautifully, wonderfully complex scenario where you weave in, there's political elements, there's intrigue, there's these great hard decision spaces that you're going to explore, but you only get to run the game once and you only get to run it for two days, which means that you don't actually get to get, get to all those questions. And so what ends up happening is you have this beautiful scenario where you've asked your players to talk about all these things and they don't have time to think about any of it except for an inch deep and they're overwhelmed. Um, and therefore you get a bunch of inch deep data that you really didn't need the players there to get, right? They never really struggled with any of the core issues. In essence, the topic was too broad. Um, that is, uh, you know, some of the most famous, uh, I don't want to say disasters, but some of the, the more infamous war games, right? This is exactly what happened is they had a, a um, objective statement that was extremely broad. And then the scenario was extremely broad. Uh, and when those things started to break down, um, it just snowballed into, uh, into, a, into a game failure. Um, the other thing that, that you want to talk about, we talked about, right, is you also want to understand what the, the desired end state for each one of your players are. What do you want? each faction uh, or the players within that faction to be thinking about or to have taken away or to have explored uh, by the end of your game. Um, there is varying degrees, you know, this, this can be a little bit more uh, open-ended, right? So if you're doing an educational game, um, right, where you know the space, you know you know, the outcomes given certain inputs pretty well, right? You're, you're teaching. Uh, you can have very, very detailed, you know, outcome statements. I want my Marines to understand basic squad fighting tactics. You know, I want them to be able to you know, take out a pillbox. I want them to understand the basics of taking out a pillbox, right? For an, for an educational game, perfectly reasonable when you start getting into exploratory or analytical games, right, we're heading into a space where uh, there's a lot of unknowns, especially if your game is, is stochastic. So if there's gonna be dice rolling of one degree or another, there's this element of randomness. Um, you're not gonna know what the end state is. Um, and you may not, you know, you may not know what uh, events are going to come up and drive the conversation depending on your players. Um, I've been in war games where you may not even know who the players are uh, until a week before because you don't control your invite list. Um, so in those situations, right, you wanna be, this is an area where it's okay to be a little bit vague because you wanna have some flexibility. Um, I, as Sebastian uh, has pointed out, I tend to live on the quantitative side of analysis. Um, and so I tend to skew more towards more detail, more detail, more detail, lock it all down, you know, leave no room for error. And the reality is we're talking about humans, right? That's not, that's not reasonable, it's not possible. Um, and in fact, for many of these situations, it's not desirable. We want people to explore the space and to have new insights, things that we've missed, right? So then we can turn around uh, and go explore those things, you know, thinking about the cycle of research. Um, and so in those cases, you want to have a little bit more open-ended uh, lessons learned you know i want my players to explore uh the potential choke points in air defense i want my players to have explored uh alternate concepts of employing aircraft um you know there are uh, there's a multitude but again 
even though it's open-ended, you want to make sure it aligns to your objective. That helps inform, or it is also helpful, or I think required, you need to think about what decisions do you want your players to make. Um, this is an area that I did not come fully cognizant of until I think just a few years ago, probably maybe a year and a half ago. Right, because it, it's when you're first into game design, you you're thinking about well, you know, you, you probably have a, a cool story in mind. You've got your forces, you know. You looked up on on mill balance what the you know the, the relative force levels are, and you you know did some research on on you know unit composition. You've got that all laid down, and you we tend to just kind of assume that like well, it's in the rules, right? I've got all these great rules uh, for what you can do, so that'll tell the players. Um, the decisions they can make. Um, but as information-based decision-making, what I mean by that is humans don't, it's really hard for most humans to like look at a, a, most people to look at a, a rule book and just instantly know it's like, oh, I can do all this stuff, right? They'll read it, they'll comprehend in little chunks and there'll be things that stick out to them that, that matter to them. But for the most of it, it's going to go in the background chatter. And the reality is for most analytical games, because your players are very busy, um, it very well might be that they don't read the rules, right? I think that is that is a hard truth that sometimes because of time constraints, the read ahead packet doesn't get read. Um, and so you want to make sure often what will happen, right, rather is that in the scenario, in the gameplay, um, that's when player they're going to interact with the information you give them through the scenario and say, oh, this is my objective. This is what's going on. And then they'll start thinking about in the real world, what would I do? What can I do? So often um, if there is, sorry. So you can use your scenario, right? To help key players into what key decisions I want them to be thinking about. What do I want them to focus on? Um, if you've ever had, I, I don't know if you've had this experience, um, but perhaps in undergraduate, you know, you were in a, you know, English 101, English 102 class, and your final, uh, paper is, uh, you write on anything you want, right? 20 pages, you know, write me an essay, uh, you know, a, a per perfect persuasive essay on anything you want. And you sit there and you look at the paper and you go, the problem is too big, right? There's so many things that you could write on. And you don't want to get down there halfway down and realize that you've written on something you don't actually care about or like it's actually kind of an obvious decision or maybe there is no decision maybe there's no good answer right uh the same thing is true with your players right so you'll get questions like well what can i do um we can solve that through good scenario design right we can solve that by saying things at the front end of you know, in your first turn, right? And I, this is something I've really become a fan of that I've seen several game designers do, and I think it's really good, right? Is you actually start with a, a um, especially for an analytical game, because uh, as you have your red side, because often your red side is, is working with your, um, your adjudication team, set up a, uh, an incoming attack. So the first turn is dealing with this incoming attack. Um, and you build that incoming attack to address, to really focus on those things that you want to discuss. Maybe it's air defense. Maybe it's subsurface warfare. Maybe it's um, future vertical lift, you know, aircraft. I don't know. Whatever you want to you want to put in there. Um, but it's a way to key your players to help, especially in that first term, to to boil down. The, the decision space into a, uh, a starting point. Um, and then of course we've talked about the resources, we've already covered that. Um, okay, so that was that was a little bit of an info dump. So before we move on, any, any questions at this point? So Mike, you talked about a, a bunch of different ways to think about scenarios. Do you employ any specific techniques whether that's like mind mapping or future trend analysis, anything that you can try to share about how to design scenarios or storylines for games. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I really do like mind mapping as a, a starting point. Um, I, as I think some of you know, I, I am a little tangential, 
tangential in my thinking. And so mind mapping kind of allows me to start hitting that space of hitting some of these things um, and figuring out how they start connecting. So I actually do a, um, a, a web map, right? So I, I start with blank piece of paper and I start putting down terms and I start drawing lines between those terms about how they connect. Um, I do like future trend analysis. I, I do like, I like research in general, right? Shocking, I work for an FFRDC. Um, my only concern is that we sometimes when we, when we do future trends analysis and we're, and we're looking at um you know especially technology trends is we miss the opportunity to think about black swan events uh, which i get that's that's a little contradictory like how can you expect something that is unexpected um but i think it is worth occasionally taking some time and just be like what is the craziest thing that could happen Right. Um, and then narrowing that down a little bit. Again, that sounds a lot like my mapping. That's the process that I use. Um, I see Emily has a question. Um, so why don't we go to that one? So Emily asks, what are some objectives you enjoyed in gameplay? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a really good one. Um, so there is one of the ones I've really, really enjoyed um, are where you are, it's not a total um, zero sum game win loss, but you're trying to, um, it's in essence a, a negotiation game, right? Where you're trying to win. So you're trying to hit this very specific number in terms of your negotiation points um, without pushing the other side too far in the negative. Um, and so there's this wonderful balancing act that happens within um, that objective scenario right where you're you're trying to win but you're also trying to help the other side win it's just a very different way of of thinking about um the negotiation space from what we normally do in like a military game right where we're we're generally seeking military objectives which tend to be zero sum um, don't have to be right you can do asynchronous i love asynchronous objectives right where your players are working off of um working towards different goals that may or may not align um and have different methodologies for getting there because I, I, I think that is a, you know, outside of, you know, nation state on nation state, you know, peer near, near peer and peer on peer combat. I think that's actually a better representation of what we actually see in the real world, right? Like, um, and for me, it's, it's, a, it's a more interesting thought process examination, right? As opposed to just, hey, we're here, we got to kill each other someone is going to be standing on top of the pile and we're done, right? That's, that can be interesting, uh, but often I, I, I find it's, it's much more straightforward and I don't get to do as, as much kind of critical, well, not critical, but um, new thinking maybe is the, the right term. We have another question that says, I'm wondering how you handle the impact of introduction of new technology. Do you run a baseline without the technology? Yeah, that's it. So often what we'll do, and I, I say this as a, as a larger game group, because um, is we'll draw on pre-existing research uh, about how that technology, if any exists, how that technology is supposed to um, change operations. Um, and then we'll try to model off of that. You normally baselining, I mean, if you, if you have you can baseline if nobody has done anything, right? If this is truly, you know, like something brand new, um, the issue with that is it takes a lot of time. Uh, and often with game design, you, it would be wonderful if you had two years to design a game. Um, rarely do you get that amount of time. And so often what you do is you um, try to either crib from previous games that used a baseline, you know, the ads is, um and use those outputs as as your baseline um or if you have the 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 data available you look at um empirical data so what improvements have been, been done in testing that can be difficult uh, because often that data is classified um and even if you have classified access you may not have uh it may not be available to you um the program offices for good reason 
um, you know, take need to know very seriously. Um, and often, you know, informing a war game is, is not need to know. Um, the last thing, if you have a lot of time uh, and a really large budget, is you can use modeling and simulation to start getting at some of those answers. Um, but that's probably a year investment. Uh, and I, I can't really give you a dollar amount, but it's, it's probably a year investment of time if it doesn't already exist. If it already exists, just use the pre-existing data. But if it doesn't, um, the last option, and I think probably what happens a lot is uh, you get with your subject matter experts on that technology um, and you start having some conversations um, about potential effects um, and, and uh, how it changes things. It's actually something I'm going through right now with some technology that we're looking at for a client, trying to understand both uh, how it improves over the as is, but also how does it change uh, techniques? Um, how, sorry, I was thinking TTPs, and I couldn't remember what TTP actually stands for. Um, techniques, something in procedures. Basically, how do you use it, right? Because if the technology is truly transformational, it should change how you operate. Um, and that can be a hard space to, to project into, right? So you get with your, your SMEs, you do the, the research, you can use the, the information uh, that's available, and then you caveat. You know, if you, there's just not a lot of information on the space that is available for the level that you're doing your war game at, you know, whether it's unclassified or controlled unclassified information or above, you just be very honest and, and say what your caveats are and what you can and can't represent. So the other T is tactics and tactics, techniques, and procedures and TTPs. That's um, right. Uh, don't worry, the Marine Corps will, the, the, the Marine in the room will help you. Um, the other question is, what is your opinion of not revealing objectives between each side? Like, for example, blue does not know what red is really trying to do or achieve, or neither side know what uh, green or like the third party country is um, trying to get out of a situation. Yeah, uh, I think it's a great methodology if your objective calls for it. Um, and if you're doing an analytical game, if it's reasonable um, that your blue side uh, or, or that there would be ambiguity between sides on objectives. Um, I can't think of any obvious scenarios where that would that would occur. Um, but that doesn't mean that, it, that they don't exist. So I think it can be a perfectly reasonable. Uh, methodology, given your objectives. So in that case, how would you uh, go about keeping that kind of uh, uncertainty between players? Or do you share some of it? Or is there some kind of gray space in between? Yeah, absolutely. So if I'm playing, um, and again, uh, if you, it, again, it'll depend on the objective. So there's 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 a couple things you need to, to keep in, in mind. You know, total isolation um is probably impossible because your your players are probably going to go out after the game and have a beer together and talk uh so unless they're taking the game just extremely seriously things are probably going to get leaked um if that is what you're trying to go for and understand that there's going to be some small leaks what i would do is i would publish different read ahead packets or handout packets for the different teams um, another methodology is that you use breakout rooms and breakout sessions so that the teams you do, you know, day one, um, you know, first two hours is the intro and then, you, you know, hour three, you go to breakout rooms and each team is given their uh, team brief, right, which is where you present um, those hidden objectives. Um, I do like, so if you're playing, especially if you're playing a national security level, so are you playing full, uh, you know, national means um, kind of game. I do like the partial because it gives you an opportunity to do intelligence injects, right? So it gives you an opportunity if you have uh, intelligence folks in the room um, to kind of play a, uh, you know, a little bit of a role giving some injects, um, you know, talking with them and saying, hey, when it would be reasonable to kind of reveal this information. Um, it helps your players uh, really incorporate that I part of dime um so i really i really have seen that work well um i'm sure there are many flavors in between uh you know i would the only thing i would encourage you against um this is actually yeah is is false information um in in player rejection the reason i say that is i, I get 
that right like false information is reality in our world um it's something that we are all struggling with um and it affects decision makers absolutely 100 percent agree um the issue is that there's a lot of trust in the game in a successful game um and while it may be accurate in terms of fidelity to lie to your players, being in a position where you're lying to your players and they no longer trust you um, means that they will not come to you with their playthrough questions, uh, right? And they will doubt everything you say. And so that quickly turns against you and quickly becomes a validation session. I say something, then we have to validate it. Do they believe me? <clears throat> And so you end up with this kind of game on top of a game that's actually not really helpful um, and actually undermines the game. Um, so that, that would be the one caution is, is I, I get why you would want to do it, uh, but I would, I would recommend to not lie to your players if you can help it, unless there's a, an absolutely, again, guidelines, right? If there, there's a driving, if you're doing a game about information decay, um, you know, just be upfront with your players, right? That like, hey, don't assume that all information is good. Um, just if you're going to do it, I guess that's really the answer. If you're going to do that, make sure it is 100% in line with your objective and be very clear with your players up front. Um, gotcha moments can really derail a game very quickly. And it's very hard to get your players back um, when you're in that situation. Hey, Mike, how about we press on and I'll, we'll table the questions for now? Yeah, absolutely. All right, so talking a little bit, diving a little bit into factions a little bit. Um, and we've talked about some of this. So who are the competitors? Who are my sides? And this can be where like, um, this is really where your research um, can go. And I'm, I'm, I'm gonna make a quick caveat here. We've talked, uh, you know, again, I'm an analytical war gamer. I am dealing with, with real world or near future type scenarios. Um, and so when I'm talking about research, I'm thinking about actual, you know, what is Russia, the People's Liberation Army, PLA, um, <clears throat> terrorist organizations, right? What are they doing? What materials do they have? What are their objectives? What are their approaches? What are their desires? Right. I, real research. And so you'll see on my research section, I've listed some uh, databases that I found useful. I appreciate that not everybody on this call uh, will ultimately become a national security researcher. We'll do national security war games. Some of you may just want to do national security themed um, games for fun, right? Uh, popular games. And so this is, a, you know, and you might want to do that. Maybe you want to do that in a fantasy universe. Maybe you got an idea for the new D&D campaign setting. I don't know. But thinking about your faction, doing your research, right, doesn't just have to be real world. This can be an opportunity for you to write out, right, and to do that world building side of it. I think thinking it in terms of world building is really effective, right, um, because it, it helps you think about those core questions. Why are they in conflict? What resources does each faction have available to them? And then what's really important is how much of those resources are they willing to commit uh, at this time to that conflict. Often we get in the situation where we, we talk about foreign entities as if they are a, a monolith um, and if they're going after this thing they are, it's it's ride or die, right? Like the reality is humans are much more pragmatic than that, um, right? There, there is an internal calculation whether acknowledged or not of how much they're willing to give for something. We all go through it. Um, and so it's important to kind of think through um, what is reasonable for your faction, which they they might throw at it. Now you might say, you know, Taiwan is 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 kind of hot in the news. CSIS did their game. Um, you know, Sebastian just did a game. Um, so you might, you know, if you don't think about this, you might make a, a scenario where you say, well, China throws the kitchen sink at Taiwan. They clean out. Uh, Central Command, they clean out North, you know, North Theater Command, they clean out Central, they clean out South. Um, sure, but 
you know, and you can make that scenario. The problem is you're going to start getting pushed on because the reality is, is like the PRC has long land borders with Russia and India. Um, it is, uh, it has major concerns about its far west where, you know, it's committing war crime or crimes against humanity. Um, and so there are good reasons why they wouldn't just clear the bench, right? Beijing, those are their tier one assets that are designed to protect the capital. That is the brain trust. Um, they would need to be, you know, a pretty serious situation for those troops to get pulled away. Um, but if you haven't thought about that, right, if you're just like, well, it's Taiwan, clear the benches, right, you're, you're going to miss that nuance. Um, you're going to miss that discussion of, hey, maybe things didn't go right in the first 48 hours of our, our war for Taiwan. What are we willing to take from where, right? What, what's the risk calculus that I'm not willing to do, which is a really interesting space, right? But if you just clear the benches, you never get there because they have everything they need. They never have to think about like, yeah, but what if, you know, India decides they want that 100, you know, kilometers of territory back, um, right? So you're, you're, you're missing out. You're, and we'll talk about this. You're foreclosing on an interesting and important discussion space that uh, just through your scenario design. Um, and this is really where doing the research becomes important. Um, you want to make sure that whoever you're representing, you have a good handle on their operational concepts, um, on their strategic position and their goals. <clears throat> uh, and their stated national objectives. There are a lot of databases out there. Um, they can be really useful for this. And I want to be clear. Perfection is not a reasonable goal. You're never going to be, the reality is, is again, it's a war game. It is a representation, right? It's a simulation. I know we don't really use that word, but it is, it's, it's a simulation. It's a model of the real world that we use to explore space. Um, it's not meant to be perfect. So you're, you're trying to give a reasonable and acceptable uh, representation of these forces. Um, without going crazy. So things like Tradox Odin database and IHS Janes. Um, Janes you have to have a subscription to, generally it's very expensive, so you would get it through your organization. Um, Army uh, Training and Doctrine Command Tradox Odin database is a free open access database on military, a foreign military technology. Um, it's really nicely laid out. Uh, if you haven't had, if you haven't looked at it before, just Google Tradoc Odin, um, and it will have a lot of great information for you. Um, Army, the U.S. Army has a series of tactical publications, uh, ATPs about foreign military tactics. Uh, the most recent one is the one on the PLA. It's very well written. Um, there are also things like IH or um, military balance. Uh, which often through your university or through your employer, you can get at least the PDF of the most recent version, um, if not access to their database. Uh, and then there's also game reports. Um, game reports generally can be a little harder, but the, the place that can be really good for that is um, DTIC. So it's D T I C. -K. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, Defense Technology Information Center. I think you can find uh, a significant amount of really good information from game readouts or game files that get posted on DTEC. Um, also a lot of good analysis gets posted up there as well. Um, the search engine uh, can take a little bit of getting used to, but there's actually a couple of good YouTube videos. Uh, if you just use YouTube searching DTEC, um, that'll get you helped out. When you are, um, the reason that we do factions first, the reason I, I kind of approach my factions first, right, is that I have this, um, once I've gone through and I've identified what their motivations are, what their resources are, and what their kind of break-even points are, right, I, I'm starting to enable myself to build the, uh, understand and build the narrative for why they're here, why we're in this scenario, why they're looking to do whatever it is that we're looking to do. I found if I start um, with looking at the location or doing the road to war first, uh, and then I go back, it, it generally means I have to um, do some pretty heavy rewrites, um, which just eats up time. 
Um, and as you'll, you'll kind of notice game design, uh, especially within the national security space, time is always of the essence. You almost never have enough time to do everything you want. So whatever you can do to shorten that time, uh, that development time is really, really in your favor. Um, all right, so any questions about factions before we move on? Cool. Uh, one thing right, so, I want to add, Mike, real quick, oh, um, for the Trade uh, Tradoc Odin, there's also the uh, the date database, T A T E. Yep. It's on the same website. Um, if you are in a, like a tactical unit or a command, they also have like these fleshed out countries that are fake. They can use for your war games with like economic details and political details and all this like fake history that you can use for your games. Um, yep. That is sort of standardized across Tradoc. Yeah, the the date. Sorry, and you're absolutely right. The date database is wonderful. Um, Odin is, is really designed to help inform more games, um, which is made it as his date, right? That's, that's kind of the, the driving force. So they're both, they're, it's really great. Um, I actually probably use it more now than I, I use Jane's. Um, so thinking about, so once we have a good, really good understanding of our factions, we need to start thinking about our location. Um, and again, uh, well, you're going to hear me say this a lot, right? You want to think about your locations in terms of your of objective, right? The where it will take place is kind of simple, right? You, you, you know, based off of the motivations of your two sides, and generally coming in, you right, you have some kind of sense of of where this is going to go down, right? Now it could be, uh, and I want to be careful, right? Um, when I say location, it could be a geo geographic location. It could also be something more amorphous, like cyberspace, you know, a section of cyberspace, right? If you're doing a pure cyber game, right? then physical location may not matter as much. It might if you're doing like um, physical access kind of stuff, but um, right. But that's your space. Um, but one thing you want to think about is, uh, is the competition within this area that you've chosen, is it going to be limited or unlimited? Um, in other words, is there room for horizontal escalation? So I'll give you a perfect example. So if we're thinking in a Taiwan scenario and we're thinking about our scenario, we're thinking about how that interacts with our play pieces. So, you know, my, my player aids, so very common player aid is a map. Um, you know, most war games have a map of some sort, right? Um, if I am, if my competition is limited, right, that I have set it up and say, hey, we are only looking at, uh, you know, we're going to, I'll make up a hypothetical. Let's say we're doing a game and we, we're looking, we're, we're doing a long war scenario and we're only thinking about, um, you know, after the PLA has made a landing, right? We, we're kind of assuming the rest of it has already happened. This is our game. Um, if it's limited, as in, we're gonna assume that this conflict is gonna, you know, all we care about is, um, kicking off the joint landing force uh, off of Taiwan. And we're not gonna talk about what's happening in Japan. We're not gonna talk about what's happening elsewhere in the world, um, right? That's a, that's a limited scenario. We're not looking at horizontal escalation. Um, it would make sense, right, then to have a map that is just Taiwan, right? We're not gonna talk about all those other things. If I have a limited competition game and I have a world map, um, what that does is it keeps my players that like, hey, there's other areas that I can do stuff. I want to do stuff out there, right? It is really frustrating for your players if they have this really cool idea of, you know, I want to cut a supply line here, right? And you say, well, yeah, that's great. And I know it's on the map, but we're not playing that. We're only focused on this one thing. And if you have to keep coming back and coming back and coming back and doing that, it's extremely frustrating for your players, um, right? And it, it makes sense, right? You keep them to think about a worldview through your map, through your player aid, but your scenario is limited confrontation, right? And so this is, this is you start seeing some of these gaps that I was talking about that can open up. Um, another important thing to think about is how your factions are getting to the location, right? Let's say we're doing a historical game. Maybe we've talked a lot about analytical futures games. Well, let's say we're doing a historical game. Let's say we're doing a, a um, World War II, right? We're doing, maybe we're doing some kind of analysis or, or um, possible futures, right? We're exploring like, well, what if uh, the U.S. had gotten the bomb in 42? Or what if the U.S. had um, 
developed the M16 early, I don't know, or, or built the HIMARS in the 40s, whatever, right? Um, but in that situation, right, so how do the U.S. forces get to, we'll say we stick with what happened in history, get to Africa, right? Um, are we going to simulate, in our, in our scenario, are we going to open up uh, supply line attacks? Um, are we going to, uh, how are forces going to flow from the U.S. to Europe, um, right? So one side is kind of in defense, it is kind of contiguous, once, especially once you get outside of, of Africa, you start getting into the uh, mainland Europe campaign. Um, or maybe we only want to focus on, you know, the first year of the war, right? And so we're just looking Germany, Belgium, France. Um, well, we don't really have to think about how they get there. They're there, right? It's a, it's a shared board border. Um, maybe we're thinking about like a Vietnam scenario where it's a surrogate war where both sides are flying in or bringing in um, forces for different reasons, right, to two sides, but they're not, they're not connected uh, directly. These are really important to help you start informing what those uh, in your road to war, um, what your opening positions are going to be. Um, and what those uh, comparative force levels are going to be. Um, you don't have to go super deep. You don't have to uh, start, you know, looking at exact supply lines and counting the number of, of um, ships that make that transit every day. Um, but you do want to think about, you want to put some thought about, you know, what's, what's reasonable that, you know, over a given amount of time that you could, you could move into that region. Um, and again, I hit do your research. Uh, you can actually do a surprising amount with Google Earth. There are some limitations, um, right? You, you Google Earth uh, elevation data, right? It's roughly around that 10 meter, um, three meter to 10 meter kind of area. Uh, so you're probably not going to be able to do like detailed beach analysis and figure out which beaches people can land at. Um, and it's not going to give you information about, you know, how big ships can dock at what ports. But then you can start using things like CIA, CIA World Book, World Fact Book. Um, there are, you know, if you're already in the space and you, you want some more resources, we can talk about some stuff that exists uh, in other contexts that, that can help perform this. And again, DTEC and game reports can be really useful for understanding what's already been done, especially for other games that are aligned with kind of your objective and your question set that you're uh, examining. Um, that if you know and you can go see what their justification were and if it seems reasonable right you can just you can use that um all right let's let's talk about world war where i'm a little behind uh where i was planning to be probably because i'm talking too much um so let's hit world war and then we'll stop for some questions then we'll talk about what the sins are and then i'll try to leave about 30 minutes for for questions at the end um, or at least a discussion um so now we, we've, we've kind of hammered out our factions, we've hammered out our location, and now we're bringing those together to develop this road to war, this uh, narrative document that explains to our players what they're fighting over, what kind of end ways and means um, they have available to them, um, and the kind of timeframes that we're talking about, um, right? And so it's, it's important, you know, you really want to make sure your bottom line up front, you don't necessarily have to have a bluff, right? But but in those opening, that opening paragraph, you really want to hit the why of the the, um, the war game because what you're using is you're using the power of narrative, right? You're using the power of story, which sticks in people's brains uh, better than just exposition. Um, why they're here, you know, what's the centrality of the fight? What are they fighting for? We're fighting for, you know, the independence of Pinelandia. We're fighting for uh, access to um, major chip. You know, manufacturers. We're fighting for an end. You know, maybe it's a diplomatic game. We're fighting for the end of this conflict uh, in some third nation. Um, it's important that that sticks because often once you get into the uh, the nitty gritty of the gameplay, you're two or three turns in. You know, um, for big analytical games, right? That's probably day two or three. You know, people are tired. They've had these eight to ten hour days of play. Um, and it's really easy if it was not absolutely clear and done in a narrative way for them to forget 
what the heck they're fighting for. And then your game very quickly turns into kind of target warfare, where it's just like, what's the pop up and can I shwack it? Um, which uh, outside of uh, some very specific topics, doesn't serve, um, generally doesn't, isn't gonna serve your research topic, right? So you wanna make sure that you really, it, it's the hook, right? So if we're talking about narrative writing, it's, it's your why is that hook um, that gets your players drawn in and keeps them focused on the objectives of your study. Um, the other things that you wanna be, you wanna make sure you cover because they, they build in that hook and they help frame the context of the game. You wanna talk about um, what events led, caused or led to the current situation. You might say like, Mike, who cares, right? Like, can't we just say, hey, we're here, we're fighting. Um, but that context matters because it actually influences the decisions um, of your players. What I mean is um, there is going to be a discussion of uh, acceptable means to, to obtain stated goals, right? Um, and a lot of that is gonna depend, some of that is gonna be fed by how did we get here? If it's purely the US, um, if we're talking, you know, uh, at an oper operational game, um, if the U.S. is here, got here because we're doing internal security operations, right? You know, special forces helping on an ally, you know, and maybe doing training. Um, then, you know, the players are going to be much more hesitant to start escalating into a full military conflict, right? Because we had a very limited kind of mission space that we started in. Uh, without some kind of direction from international command authority versus if they're just like, hey, we're here, this is an ally, you know, it's time to go, right? That that sets your players up for a decision that is much more broad. Um, either of those can be right, right? It's going to depend on on the objective of the game and the, the, the decisions that you want your players to explore. Um, that's why we try to get the objective and the faction stuff written first. So it helps us determine um, what is an appropriate uh, road to war for our players. Um, and again, we're gonna hit again, what actions have each of the, the sides taken and why? Um, the why does not have to be known to both sides, right? This is a great area where you can have some asynchronous play. Um, and often we'll see that when we're, we're playing red cells, right? The red cell, uh, especially in analytical games, or often, like I said, will be kind of helping the white cell. Um, and you kind of, you co-develop with your red cell, like the reasons for why they've done what they've done, um, which can be really, really powerful, right? Those, those uh, we often do them in lunch sessions, but sometimes they're done in breakout sessions of explanation of why did you react the way that you react? Help me understand this thinking that I don't understand. It can be really powerful. Um, current positions uh, and available forces. You can think of this as opening state of the board, um, right? But you wanna make sure your players understand where they are so that they can begin planning where they wanna be, right? Um, really important. This is a lesson I had to learn. Um, I had to learn the hard way, which is the first draft does not equal the final draft. Uh, We've all been there. We've produced something that we think is just absolutely beautiful. Uh, and then we let other people read it, they comment on it, maybe we take it to a SME for, sorry, subject matter S expert, SME, SME, um, to take a look over and they go, yeah, it's not really how this works, right? Uh, I can think of um, a couple times I've had that episode. It, you know, it is really important uh, to be willing to revise and edit. Um, and play testing can be a really important part of, of this process. Um, I am a big believer in play testing. I, I generally prefer to, to play test my games two or three times before we go live, exactly because I want people to interact with not only the total game, but to interact with the scenario, to read it, to look at it. Because one of the things you also will find is that you may have inadvertently added things into your scenarios that distract from the objective of your game or left out critical pieces of information that your, your players need in order to make decisions to get to the objectives of your game. And often when you're in the moment and you've read this document like 60 times and you've edited it, you know, 
just as many times and you kind of just want to get to the game, you start missing stuff because it's it's implicit knowledge that's built into you. You know what you mean, um, right? And so your brain is just automatically processing that information, but your players don't. They weren't there, right? They weren't in the trench with you writing the document. And so having other people read it, doing play text, play tests where uh, players have to interact with that document um, and then just editing and just being absolutely brutal and being willing to kill bad ideas or things that don't work um, is really important. And the last thing is, again, this it's not going to be perfect. There's an artistic portion to uh, scenario writing and knowing what's good enough. The things I talked about will help you get there. But understand that, like, end of the day, there's always going to be somebody who hates your scenario um, for whatever reason. There's always going to be somebody who thinks they can make it just a little bit better. Um, there is a principle of okay, good enough, right? Um, it's got to be able to serve the objective. It's got to hit, you know, get, you know, whatever that is, the 65 or 85% of your players on target. And beyond that, it's good. Right, you don't want to spend so much time on on this section that you ignore other really important parts of your work game. Uh, let me pause there for questions real quick. I said it looks like we've had several. So, a question we have is: Ever had a client give you an unbelievable road to war, and have you still had to use it? And how did you handle it? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. This comes up a lot. Um, I have been lucky that I have been able to handle my own roads roads to war, but I have been um in terms of when I'm, I'm game designer i have worked on on games where i am an adjudicator or on the red cell um that we have roads to war that are just absolutely ridiculous um when you are in you, you the, the short answer is you do your best right if you're a game designer um try to under would i what I would do or what I've seen done and has been effective is you go to your sponsor, you try to understand why they want this road to war, why that's important for them. Because sometimes the road to war might be absolutely crazy um, for a, you know the world as it is right now. But what it may do is it may serve to explore some interesting questions that, that can't, you can't get at any other way. Right. Um, and it's important to keep in mind that, especially when we start talking 10, 25, 10, 20 years in the future, um, I will venture to say this is, this is a Mike Bond, um, you know, hot take. So take it for what it's worth. We have pretty limited ability to guess what the real world's going to look like in that time period. Um, and therefore, I'm willing to accept a little bit of craziness to get at an interesting point. Um, and so the first step is try to understand why your, your, your customer wants that. The second step is if it's based on a misunderstanding of current trends uh, or of current analysis or current understanding, um, you try to clarify that and see if they want to continue. Uh, if you go through that and they want to continue, um, and this is the, the way they're going to go, um, then you execute. And I, and I know that's not necessarily the you know i got to do the right thing i don't want to do this i should just take my name off that kind of answer but the reality is end of the day that they are they are the government sponsor if you're doing national security they are paying for the game um and so they take on you you caveat appropriately right and you you know very upfront in your your follow-up report um that you know this is this is a scenario we understand that uh it may not be the most um, likely to happen in the future, but these are the reasons that we we did it, right? And you just be, you do your best. You caveat, but at the end of the day, your responsibility is to to do what the sponsor asks you to do. And if if they are insisting that they have to have a scenario that you think is crazy, you execute on the scenario. So I guess another question is, how do you handle? You know what I mean? biases or develop or avoiding biases in scenario design yeah that's a it's a good one um and it's a really important one and i think a really good way to do that is have people who are not part of the design team um 
read your scenario design, um, both subject matter experts and people who aren't subject matter experts. One of the, so I'll give you a, a really good example. Um, it is common within the China studies field. Uh, the kind of perceived wisdom that is passed down uh, is that if China commits a, a commits to a military reunification of Taiwan, they're in it to win it, right? It is it is either win or die. There is no pullout. Um, and so a lot of, you know, that tends to be from the China crowd, how we approach things. That's how we think about it. Is that really, do people really work that way, right? Do we really see the leadership of the PLA and the CCP as being so fanatical they'd be willing to toss away leadership of their country for this province, right? If things got really bad. I didn't run into that. So if you haven't guessed, I, I, I kind of actually doubt that analysis, even though that is what I argued for years. And it's because I, I when I was at NDU and I was at Castle, um, I was, we were working on a war game. Um, that's the position we took for this, this matrix game we did. And we had a state department rep who was there. Uh, and he and I had a conversation. He really pushed back hard. And it was not a the guy was not a China hand, um, just a real smart statey. Um, and right, he made some really good arguments. Um, and I realized that like, I had this kind of perceived wisdom bias of this red monolith, right? That was just, <laughs> just gonna roll downhill, which, which probably isn't very accurate. So I, I would say, absolutely make sure you uh, consult SMEs to have them read over, but also just get some people who understand this, that space, perhaps not from that specific standpoint, maybe from a different one to also read it to see if they can identify any biases. So as I wait for another question, um, I also will also ask another one is yeah. how, how do you, so how do you collaboratively do scenario design? I know in my experience, I've done it with the sponsor. I've done it with other teams and in, um, in your organization. How do you manage collaborative scenario design when you're not the single sole author and you're trying yeah. to get everyone sort of to get their ideas onto the table? Yeah. So there's a couple different ways to, to approach this and it kind of depends on um what the team design is so if it's purely it's a team but it's internal to organization i think microsoft teams is pretty common these days um so what i'll use is microsoft teams um and the very first thing we'll do is i'll hold a team meeting and at least for our version of teams we have um a uh, a whiteboard app that's built in and so it's literally everybody gets a digital pen and we just start putting pictures and notes and thoughts onto this whiteboard. It's super chaotic. Um, it is truly the brain map, brain splat, initial approach. Then what I'll do is I'll take that, that first kind of cut from that initial talk through. And I, as the game designer, will turn that into a Word document, put it up on Teams, and then give everybody editing permissions. And then um, depending what their role is, right? So you make... Um, you start making very specific assignments with due dates. I generally find for that first cut, you two weeks is probably the max you want to do. And I get that some people are like, oh my gosh, is that enough time for teacher? I get it. understood. Um, normally, if you're building a journal teams, right, you're trying to have people who are some subject matter experts on the areas that you want to explore, right? And so at least that's how, how I do it. And so I, I make generally experience expecting them to use some prior knowledge to offset needing to go additional research. If there's truly areas that just we have to do original research on, I'm going to extend that timeline. Now, if you are working with your sponsor, which I generally like to do, um, especially if it's a government sponsor, it can be hard to get them on into your team space. Not impossible, but it's generally pretty hard. Um, KiteWorks can be a really effective tool for that. Generally, um, military, pers uh, military DOD clients have access to KiteWorks, um, and depending on which space it is, you can hang um, straight unclassified or CUI materials. Um, so make sure your KiteWorks is validated for that before you do it. Um, spills are bad. We don't want spills. Um, right, but that can be a, um, a really good way to approach it. So normally what I'll do is if we are going to work with a sponsor is I'll have my internal team get us a first draft of what that scenario design, that road award looks like. 
Um, and then I'll post it to KiteWorks and have the sponsor, you know, take a week to read it, to give responses. And then instead of just doing the comments, because <clears throat> sometimes like comment bubbles can be hard to interpret, um, I try to set up a meeting. So this was something I did in a, a, a project two years ago where we actually had regular kind of battle rhythm drum beats, uh, where every month we had these big meetings where all the principals got together uh, for this thing. And we, you know, I brought the scenario document and we went through the scenario document and all the principals, we made comments, we made changes, uh, we made assignments to get more information. And so it was a live document that we edited in that meeting and everybody knew going in, right? This was not supposed to be a finished product, right? This was the next edition, we're putting in the work now to get it right. Um, and then we'd send it out uh, and that worked really well. It, I think that having those drum beats are really important for staying on task, at least they are for me. I, I'm the type of person that, like, if I have online, on, excuse me, if I have online class and I don't have like to be there on a certain day every day, like I, I just don't do it, right? I, I really find that keeping people on track and keeping you know people focused and not losing where they were, you gotta have those drum beat events. So I guess another question that I would like to ask um, is. What is your advice for people who are writing their first scenario, their first professional road to war? Um, you know, I mean, starting as their you know young designers. What advice or tips do you have? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the the thing that I would recommend is if you can, um, if you're doing a common scenario, try to go read, see if you can get your hands on a, a previous game and how they did their road to war. Um, now, my recommendation here is not to copy it. Right? Don't word for word. But look at the format, look at how they present information, look at the section headings that they cover, the topics that they cover, <coughs> excuse me, and try to use that, try to cover that first. Um, one of the other things is, um, so start there, and then under each section, only write a paragraph. The most important thing that you can think of, right? three to five sentences under each one. I'm someone who struggles, you know, there are people in the world who are incredibly fast writers who know what they want to say and they will put it down and write 20 pages in two days, <coughs> Sebastian Bay. Um, and then there's people like me who will take, uh, you know, it'll take 16 drafts to write a two page op-ed. Um, and so for me, what's been really effective is learning to, instead of trying to, to do it all at once is just get that core information down and then go back and look at where do I need to expand? If, you know, I was the player, what would I, what would I want to know? But start with that, you know, get a template that has worked for your organization and then just to simply directly, you know, sometimes I'll write swear words in there just to get my brain working, you know, right? Cause nobody else is going to see it, right? You're going to delete those. You're not going to leave those in a document. You need to be professional, but like whatever I have found that like just getting that core um, and getting the idea out really is helpful. I'm going to wait uh, a few more seconds if there are any last minute questions, but I guess the last other question I would ask is, you know, I mean, what are the most common mistakes that you see that most uh, scenarios run into, right? And how can you avoid doing those? Yeah. Um... And <laughs> that gets us to sin number one, which is overpacking. Um, we'll, uh, and, uh, um, sorry, I see some good comments. We'll, we'll hit these in a second. But I, I do want to hit this because we're starting to come up on time. So one of the most common things, and this is perhaps this is me being biased towards myself because I do this way too much, which is overpacking, right? Is it can be really tempting on your first or several scenario designs to just pack as much information in there, right, as you can, because you want to show that you did the work. You want to show that you understand the space, right? Like any written product, like any analysis, you're entering into a conversation with those who have come before you and done their analysis, right? So you're trying, it can be really easy to just throw the kitchen sink at the problem to show that you know what you're talking about, um, right? Because more information is better, right? We, we more is better. 
The problem is that that leads to three problems. It, it, it kills your readability, it kills the referenceability, and it puts a major time burden on your players. We'll, um, I, I like to use uh, visuals for this section. So like, don't expect you to read this, but like when I'm talking about readability, when you info dumping your players, um, you end up with this wall, this impenetrable wall of text, right? Which is what this graphic gets at, that your players have to read. I don't know if anybody here um, plays Dungeons and Dragons or uh, any of the, the standard commercial tabletop games Warhammer 40k, uh, Privateer Press, um, War Machine. Um, but often, like, right, one of the biggest uh, barriers to entry that, that new players list is the rule sets are daunting, right? There are these rule books that are this thick. Um, and, you you know, most players looking at it, I was like, I don't, I don't want to read that. The same thing is true for your Road to War and for your, your scenario description book, right? If you are 30 pages long, Right, your player is going to stare at that, and it's just going to be a wall of text. It's just going to be this this mass of words they have to grind their way through and try to figure out what the heck is going on. It's really intimidating. Not to say, you know, look, there are players out there who love it, right? People like me who want to read through and try to find the pivot point that I can exploit to win are out there. But for most of your players, many of whom are not will not be gamers. If you're if you're going to work in the national security space right and maybe scared of gaming to begin with because it's this weird kind of nerdy thing they roll dice it's a bunch of people you know it's all the stereotypes um the so whatever you can do so right so so with all that going in then you hand them this ginormous document that they got to read um right we'll turn people off and they just won't read it right it'll just be it'll be too much um the next problem is the referenceability. So this is one of the things that I find that we often don't think about until we're in the game, um, is that players are going to read it. There's a lot of information that goes into a war game, even when you are being parsimonious with your presentation. Um, people just aren't going to remember it. Like, even as the adjudication cell, you're probably not going to remember it. Um, so you need to be able to go back through the doc and find it. But if you've packed it full of information, much of which doesn't actually matter for your game, right, doesn't actually get you closer to your objective, that's all information that has to be sorted through now, which just makes it harder for your players to get to the information they care about. Um, that was one of the things that we, we discovered um, when we did Littoral Commander is that our original scenario books are pretty long. They were like eight pages. Um, and uh, Patrick and I, who the other game designer who did the initial playthroughs, <laughs> we spent like, you know, one time, like 20 minutes flipping through the, trying to find a specific paragraph about uh, a supply thing, um, right? It ended up being like an eight hour game uh, for a game that was designed to be like played an hour and a half. Um, right, not ideal. We were dedicated because we were the game designers, right? Um, also, Seb was giving us free pizza. So bribery works. Um, but like your, your players aren't gonna have that investment, right? Um, and so if you make it hard for them to get the information they need to make the decisions, best case is it slows the game down, right? You get bogged down um, trying to make some, some decisions or re-explaining information that should be already known. Um, and in worst case, your players just clock out, right? They're just done. You know, it's too hard to do what we need to do. I'll let somebody else drive the bus. The last thing is the time constraint. And this is really important. You need to remember that within the DOD space, but even if you're doing commercial within your player space, people's time is limited, right? Very few of us have the commitment to sit down and play, uh, you know, a three to five hour playthrough game. That's why nobody plays Monopoly by the actual rules is written, right? We all have these little like hack arounds that make the game a little faster. Um, the same thing is 100% is true, especially true uh, if you start doing, you know, major title, title 10 games where your players are general officers. You know, it's probably been a pretty big list for them to cut out the time and the schedule for them to come play this game. And if you send them a read ahead packet that is 50 pages long, they're never going to read it. They don't have time to read it, which I get it. Yes, in a perfect world, they would read it and they'd understand it and they'd come prepared. But we don't live in a perfect world. Um, and so you want to make sure that your scenario document, uh, the amount of detail you're presenting is not 
overwhelming that it is it is only what you need to inform the players of the decision space the objectives and the motivations for your game um now that does not mean that you don't have the information right this is a great area where you have it in your back pocket right you present what is necessary for the basics of the game up front and then if your players come to you and have an interesting question they've thought of a an, an important insight that's you know based on play that they want to explore right maybe they decide that like hey uh i you know iraqi scuds they're kind of a problem um we're having really trouble we're having a lot of trouble getting to the 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 the, the, the erectors you know things that set up the missiles to launch um but what if we could go after the oil supply, right? Oil supply probably, you know, probably not essential to your game, especially if you're kind of at that tactical operational level, right? So you're, you're not going to present it in your uh, document because if you do that, you're hinting to your players, hey, I want you to think about hitting the oil supply, but you may not care about them, right? But if you have in your back pocket of like, hey, you know, this is, this is not central to our objective, but it could be interesting, especially if my players have a really good argument for why it's interesting, something I didn't think about. Um, you might want to have that information in your back pocket so that you can present it at that time. Um, this is where knowledge management becomes key uh, because you don't want, you, you want to be able to present your players with enough information to get them started, but also have the information in your in you know reserve in case they come up because players will always come up with interesting things you hadn't thought about. So you bring them right. That's why we play with humans and not computers, um, because we want those insights. We want that that critical creative thinking to come out to to give us new avenues to go explore. Right. The war game is never the last step. Um, you know, cycle of research. Uh, right. The the war game is never the last step. You're teeing up further deep dives on on this research. Um, so, right, so just to recap real quick, right, too much detail, readers are going to skim instead of study, um, and they're, you know, they'll generally just grab the stuff, they're only, the only stuff that they're interested in and ignore the rest of it, which can create bias um, or misunderstanding of how the game is played and lead to situations where they make actions and they're thinking it's going to be adjudicated one way, it's adjudicated another, um, and that can, that can lead to uh, major friction. Um, if you have too much detail, it's going to make it hard to find the right information at the speed of the game, right? Drives the game for the adjudicators and for the players, and it also increases the likelihood of arguments um, over established game facts as people try to find stuff. Um, and then the last thing is your players are busy. Um, I mean, you know, how many, and the reality is, like, even for us who enjoy playing games, how many of us actually sat down and read the entire rule book before playing a game? If we aren't the, the person who, like, invited people over to play the game, we're supposed to, like, show them how to play. Right. Normally, we, we rely on somebody else to kind of teach us the rules and get us through. Um, don't expect anything different from your players. Cool. All right. Let's uh, let's take a quick break there to answer the questions, and then I'll I'll hit the second uh, the second major um, sin. We'll call it sin. I see uh, people make, including myself, and then we'll wrap up. Yeah. Go ahead, Mike. Oh, sorry. I was going to pause for questions. Or should I? Should I press? Yeah, you can go. Okay. Um, sorry, this is an important point. I keep saying what what is too much, right? Too much is a very squishy word, right? That's not you know the the quant inside me is just like ah, you need to quantify that. You know, it's it's squishy, but it depends on the objective of your game, right? For a hobby game. You know, D and D campaign models like fifty plus pages. That's totally fine because the players are invested into reading that and understanding. Right? You have a player base that understands it uh, and have accepted that as a, a facet of the game. You know, educational games, right? Where there's going to be some repetition, two to five pages um, is completely reasonable. First time might be a little rough, but you want repeatability. So we were going to play the scenario and get to understand its specific objectives. Right, it's goal, it's it's ends, ways, and means um, through multiple plays. So you can, you know, and they'll read the document multiple times. So you can have a little bit of a longer document. For an, an analytical or exploratory game where you might only get one playthrough, right? Like you might get ten slides or less. I've done it in two slides, 
um, on a PPT. And that's all you get because it's got to fit into the context of a bunch of other stuff that's got to be presented. Um, so you always want to make sure that you're, you're matching to your objective. Um, the second one is, and this kind of tees it up, right, is it's, it, it's misaligned with the objectives of your scenarios, right? And this is what we were talking about at the very beginning, where some part of the who, what, where, and where, why doesn't align with what you're trying to get at, right? A really terrible example, that are an extreme example, right, is if we're doing an air defense game and I pick a competitor, right, I can put a faction that has no air defense and no air force, right? That is, that is never going to get uh, to the space that I, I want to be in, right? Nobody's going to do that. I, I get it. But that's a, kind of an extreme example to, to get you to um, what I'm thinking. The things you want to think about are, does my scenario give one side an insurmountable advantage? Um, does my scenario provide uh, distractions that are going to trip up my players? Or are there roadblocks that cut off in discussion of important aspects uh, of my game? So the insurmountable advantage um, is it, either intentionally or unintentionally, well, generally unintentionally, I've given one side so, many, so much credit for stuff. There's actually no way to beat them. Um, now, the, obviously, the caveat, we talked about this, but analytical games, that might happen, right? But normally, the argument I make is if, if the conflict is so one-sided, right, um, generally, you don't, that can be pre-identified, right? If, if, if the capabilities are just so lopsided, um, you generally don't need a game, right? You can, you can handle that with just analytical writing, right? Now, the caveat to that is I don't think it's, it's, it's very rare it's that clear, right? Um, and so this happens more on the hobby side of gaming um, where you're looking for balance. On the analytical side for gaming, um, again, because we are trying to keep it to reality, this, this may occur and it may be an important finding of your study that as forces currently constituted or operational concepts as currently written, um, there is not a path of victory. That, that very well can be. But if it is so obvious that your players pick up on it, the game is going to end, you know, after turn two, and they're just going to quit playing um, because they'll have decided the game is, is unwinnable. Um, the, uh, the second set Second issue that you can run into is uh, rabbit holes. Um, and we talked a little bit about this when we talked at the beginning about keying, right? You have, you're doing a limited game, but you have a map that's of the, the world, right? Um, if you add, is especially um, your scenario design, you wanna be careful of, of, of keying up things that are, that are gonna quickly distract from the game. Um, so a perfect, a perfect example of this is you, um, logistics can be a really, is it really important of, of war games, a really important part of war games, but you have to be careful because depending on how detailed of a description you give of the logistics network, that can quickly turn into a rabbit hole of where am I moving toothpaste around, right? which is interesting, but not necessarily helpful. Um, you know, I have participated in a game where we had a probably 50 minute argument about how or how not the tip fit, right? Basically the flow of forces would go down given a uh, kind of a stream event that happened in turn one. Interesting. Um, but at the end of the day, didn't get to our objective in any way, shape or form. So we lost 50 minutes of gameplay to have that conversation. We could have solved that by having a very clear statement in our scenario design about, you know, what the national command authority would be willing to flow based off of assumptions about risk elsewhere in the world, right? Just avoid that question. But we left the rabbit hole open, paid the price. Um, the last thing is roadblocks. And this gets to the other side of it. If you constrain your scenario too much for your objective, right, you're going to miss really important discussions um, 
this is the other side of logistics. If you pretend logistics doesn't exist, um, you're going to miss really important discussions about, hey, can we actually feed and equip this concept or this fight that we're having? If we, you know, the, the common thing that you hear is you hold a lot of war gamers grumble about, oh, yeah, we did this war game, we didn't have logistics, and we shot through the entire, you know, stockpile of Alrazim in the first six hours. What would you do? Yeah, we told them at the end of the game, they shot through the whole pile of Alrazim for six hours, right? Like, there's never a conversation there. The players, you know, get it passively, realize, oh, yeah, okay, there's probably a logistics problem here. But they never have to deal with the reality of that decision. You've cut off a really interesting and important exploration of your, of your game um, that, yeah, you, you, it requires a little bit more work and it requires a little bit more um, creativity in your rules design and probably in your, your player aids. But if you cut that off, right, you're, you're, you're actually biasing your outcomes. Um, so this is just a, a the, again, this is another review. It's just, you know, if you stack the deck, you start worrying about issues of clocking out or fighting the scenario. But the important exception is there for an analytical game right now. So not for educational, not for, um, for fun, but for an analytical game, um, right? you because you're trying to do accurate force representations that, that may le we lead to unwinnable situations right and that could be a, a critical finding for your study um so again make sure you align that to what your objective is uh extraneous information right often uh you know either left in or left out um can get you on tangents and get you get your players down rabbit holes that don't inform the game um and lastly, you, you got to have boundaries, right? If it's the open blank paper, you'll, you know, there's no guarantee that you're going to get to the questions that your, your study's trying to get to. But if the guardrails are too tight, you're going to bias your study against talking about some, some important aspects, some important insights that your players may be having, um, right? Which is, which is bad. Okay. Um, so here's some final thoughts, and then we'll we'll open it up for questions. The last thing, and this gets to I think Seb's earlier question: scenario design is a learned skill, um, and the best way to do it is by doing it. One of the things that I started doing was trying to write very short, right? So like one page scenarios based on current events. So as you can imagine, a lot of stuff written about Ukraine right now. Um, so do a lot of of quick scenario designs, you know, lay out my objective, lay out my forces, you know, quick little design documents for, uh, you know, a um, air-based defense game. Uh, and I did one, a quick one about, um, you know, a, a tactical level game about um, water crossings, right? Crossing over rivers. Um, these are things that you can be you can you can do fairly quickly and just get reps at, at learning it. I also encourage you if you if you do that, um, so you can get your friends to read it, um, especially your friends that are in the in the um, policy space, and see if you can you know get them to give you comments back. It may not right like reading someone else's work and comments for free is not the most interesting thing. Um, the other thing that I encourage you to do is write what you know, and this is where I say this because this is why research is so important. If you're going to do national security research games, you need to know, you take time to learn the national security decision space. One of the hardest lessons that I learned when I got into the game is I had all these great ideas for research, all these things I want to do. I want to look at this. I want to look at this. Nobody's looking at this. But the reality is that we serve policy decision makers, the ones, you know, the people who actually have to make the decision. They know what their problem space is. Not every once in a while, you can, you can give them insight they didn't have before. But you want to make sure that you need to understand what their decision space looks like and what their problem sets are before you start trying to like pitch them your great idea, right? So you want to take time to learn the who and the how of national of security policy, right? And that's the, that works the same for operational tactical level stuff um, so that you can understand what decisions and what problems you can address with the games, right? In essence, how to write better objective statements. Just remember, you don't have to be a SME about everything. Nobody expects you to. You 
you're going to have people on your team or, you know, you should build your team with people who cover the areas that you're not an expert at. Um, but for that to work, you also need to not, you, you can't be an ignoramus, right? You need to be able to understand enough to understand what your SMEs are bringing to you. Um, sorry. Uh, so that you can coordinate the different parts of your scenario into a working scenario document. Um, you know, there are a lot of great books out there. Um, I was going to have a copy and I forgot to bring it up, but National Security Decision Making, it's a book about that thick. I think it's in its fifth edition. Really great book to get you a, a working understanding. Uh, and with that, uh, those are my final thoughts. What questions do we have? So do you try to include uh, unique or unusual elements in your scenarios or do you avoid them like the plague? Are you trying to get a representative <laughs> outcome by excluding special factors or do you let players run really and really push the limits if they notice them? Is there a time for one and time for the other? There is. I mean, I, the answer is there is a time for one and a time for another. If I'm doing um, a future force design game, I try to I try to be representative. I, that's that's really the sweet spot I'm going for, um, right? Because the future force is trying to cover down on the most likely scenarios, um, right? That is the design objective. Now, if I'm doing tech, right? If I'm looking at future tech, then I let my players, right? I, I let my my scenario designers and myself uh, and my players run a little wild, right? Because the great thing about tech is there's going to be these moments that are unexpected, that things are going to change. Right. Think the Internet. Think even iPhones. Right. Think how much just freaking smartphones have changed the face of warfare um, and are now being used for, you know, both I.O. and targeting and all kinds of stuff. Um, if I just try to shoot for the median, right, the representative scenario, I miss that. And I don't necessarily want to miss that with tech. Right. I want to be able to get after some of those ideas because they might be really interesting. Right. And again, because often wargaming is the first step or one of the early steps that might open up a new line of research it, um, or peak interest in a new line of research that actually leads us a, a novel solution. Um, so yeah, th those would be the two conditions that I kind of approach it from. So Mike, I think that's the last of the questions. Um, thank you for spending your, I guess, morning, right, in Hawaii. Afternoon. Afternoon. Yeah, um, it's only two. It's good. Yeah. Uh, your afternoon with us here at the Georgetown University War Gaming Society, and we really appreciate uh, sharing your experiences and your expertise with us on scenario design. And we'll hope to have you back in the future. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. I'm happy to stick around for anybody who wants to talk. Um, but uh, again, thank you. <laughs>